back with another round of Turing mock interview series. I'm Jose, I'm tech lead at Turing and I'm from Montreal, Canada. And at Turing, I work on hiring the best engineer by helping them with the vetting process. I have more than 17 years of experience and my expertise lies in JavaScript. Today, I will be interviewing James for the role of an experienced Java developer. So let's get started. Hey, James, uh, first of all, uh, how are you doing? How is your day doing so far? Uh, well, thanks, can't complain. <laughs> <laughs> nice, great. So I'm doing great, by the way, as well. So um, let's get started this interview, okay? Uh, I, will, I would like to ask you, please, to tell me a little bit more about your professional background, your professional experience, okay? And what kind of language and framework uh, are you familiar with? And then I can take from there. Sounds good? Sounds good. Uh, okay. Yeah, so I've been working, you know, as a software engineer since 2007. So got a fair bit of experience across uh, different projects and um, platforms, uh, mostly initially Java and then more recently uh, mobile development, specifically iOS. Um, but yeah, all kinds of things over the years. Um, yeah, that's sort of professionally. <laughs> You can nice. get more specific if you like, but yeah. Yeah. Okay. So thanks for sharing. So you, we have almost the same time, same experience work uh, in the Indush. Okay. Uh, I went to the JavaScript side. You went to the Java side, and mm. that is amazing, right? So, um, could you please tell me uh, a little bit about some exciting projects? Okay, Java projects that you have been work on. Yeah. So. If we're just looking at the Java stuff, two that come to mind was uh, one of my first projects was uh, for Coca-Cola Africa, and that was quite interesting. So it was a it was an environmental data tracking uh, website written with struts and JSPs and servlets. I don't know if any of these are still used. I think technology's changed a bit since then, but it was very interesting at the time, and it was used by um bottling plants all over all over Africa so that was that was my first job so it was quite a, a deep end I was tossed into um another another interesting one was um a Java app that ran on a Linux um system which coincidentally although not the same job it was quite a few years later uh, ran on QA machines in bottling plants so it you know the the system the software was used to configure the machines so they could check like bottle and can pressure and monitor for uh, anything floating in the liquid or that kind of thing so and bottles being chipped or cracked or yeah so uh, of my java apps those two were probably two of the more interesting ones nice and how, how did you measure that do you have do you work with sensors arduinos how, how did you measure that the the qa one was a uh, um the, the, the physical devices were made in-house. Uh, there's an American company called Filtech, and it was their kind of custom-made hardware. And we had one of them in the in the office. So we physically deployed to it over um over Ethernet, actually. And um nice, yeah, nice. so that's how that was the only way we could well, that was how we could test it on a physical device. Okay, that that was great. What's the constructor? Okay, uh, what do you understand about uh, constructor overloading in Java uh, and cop constructor? Okay, um, a constructor is used in conjunction with new to make a new object of any, uh, a new instance of any class in Java. Um, every class uh, has one, and if you don't create one, uh, the compiler will create a default constructor for you. Um, Constructor overloading works the same way as method overriding, um, allowing for different constructors of the same class, as long as you provide a unique list of parameters for each. Um, this could be used to set default parameters, uh, similar functionality from some other languages that support that. Um, or you could just handle your construction differently if different data is available. So it's very customizable. Um, Copy constructors um, is, is essentially using a constructor or giving a constructor an instance of the object that the constructor is trying to create a new version of. 
um, or a new instance of uh, copying the data from the existing object into the new object um, to sort of create a clone of it. And yeah. So this, it will create a clone, right? And how, how, it works, how it works with the garbage collection. So if it's a clone, so if you update one, it will update the other one. It's, not, it's a clone or a reference. Well, in Java, classes are passed around by reference uh, it, and you don't have structs, so you don't have to worry about um, that kind of thing. But it's up to you how you handle things in the constructor. So for instance, if the object that you're copying from has an object as part of its data um, and you just set that value. So say, say for instance, you, you have a class that has a date and date is an object. And then you wanna make a new, a new instance of your existing class if you just set the date um, object on your new instance to be equal to the date object on your old instance, um, and then you update the date on your old instance, it's going <laughs> to update the date on your new instance too, uh, because uh, as you mentioned, um, it's an object and it would be passed by reference. So the, a better way to handle it in your, in your um, constructor would be to create a new date object using values from the existing date object on your object that you're copying. So the um, it's really, the, the copy constructors put a lot of responsibility on you to make sure that you copy them properly or you will end up with some unintended nice. behavior. Yeah, good answer. You you kind of killed my my next question would be how- <laughs> Sorry that. about that. But, uh, but that's that's okay. So I'm glad you, uh, you mentioned that. So, uh, Regarding exceptions in Java, okay. So, how do we handle exceptions in Java? What are, I mean, what are the two types of exceptions, okay? And what do you, what do you understand, okay, by the difference between them? So, in your own words. Okay, the two types of exceptions are checked and unchecked exceptions. Um, unchecked exceptions include errors um, and every other type of exception that extends runtime exception as they as its base. Um, they're not checked at compile time. Uh, you'll run into them if you usually only if you have logical errors um, and they will cause the app to crash. Um, checked exceptions force you to handle them in code and your code won't compile if you don't either catch or throw them. Um, so yeah, on, on compile time, it'll tell you if you, if you aren't handling them properly and then you'll either have to write a try around them and, and handle them or throw them from your function. Makes sense. Sort of, mm. Makes sense. All <laughs> right. So and so uh, how how does a final block okay differ from a finalized method? Okay. Uh, final block is part of a try. Um, it always executes when the try exits, whether you um, caught an exception or not. And it's generally used um, to, you know, clean up any code. Maybe if you were using files or something, um, the temporary files or anything that you want to delete before leaving uh, that section of code or memory you want to clear or anything like that. Um, finalize is a protected method of the base object class and is called by the garbage collector before it releases an object from memory. It um, can be overridden if you choose to. Um, and then sort of you use it for, for the same kind of function. If, if there are, you know, if there's data or files that you want to clean up before the object is, is deleted, then finalize is the function to do that from. Great. And yeah. as you mentioned, uh, protected method. So let's suppose we extend uh, from that class. Could we mm -hmm. overhide that method, the finalize method, or it's not possible? I believe that it is possible, but I don't try that very often. <laughs> um. <laughs> okay, I will leave this answer. Okay, I'll leave this answer for developers fellow that are watching this video. Let me know in the comment section below, if we create a class and extend from the object class, if we can um, overhide the finalize method, please leave a comment in the section below. I will read all of them, okay? <laughs> and go ahead. Okay. No, I was just going to say you, you can definitely override protected functions of the object class, but I'm not sure about overriding protected 
uh, functions of classes that you've already overridden them in. Sorry, that's, that's what totally I'm asking. Then, yeah, yeah. That's, <laughs> totally that's totally fine. Because, uh, you know, in an interview, I, uh, we as an interviewer, we don't expect you to know everything, right? Mm -hmm. So I, I believe nobody knows everything. Okay, <laughs> so that's totally fine if you say, I don't know. Um, and I much appreciate it. So <laughs> let's go back, okay? Uh, and let me ask another question. So uh, does the garbled collection, okay, occur in a permanent generated space in GVM? Yes, uh, garbage collection does occur in perm gen space. And if perm gen space is full or crosses, crosses a threshold, it can trigger a full garbage collection. If you look carefully at the output of the garbage collector, you'll find that mm -hmm. perm gen space is also garbage collected. This is the reason why the correct sizing of PerbGen space is important to avoid frequent full garbage collections. Makes sense. And so moving on, okay. Um, could you explain the life cycle of, uh, let's say, of an applet? Yeah. Um, applets go through five life cycle um, stages. Uh, the first one being initializing. Uh, applets don't have main methods, so each one starts its execution from the init method, which is called once. Uh -huh. After that, um, the start method is called. That's called when a browser is maximized as well. Um, in between, there's paint. The paint function should be used to display any content for the um, applet. And stop uh, is called when the browser is minimized or when you're closing the website down um, and destroys the final function um, or the final life stage you know, of the applet um, and co should completely close the applet and is executed when it's closed, yeah. Great. And I have a follow-up question for you, okay, uh, uh, regarding applets. What's the difference between Apple loaded over internet and Apple loaded via the file system? Um, when an applet is loaded, over the internet, it is loaded by the applet class loader and is subject to the restrictions enforced by the mm -hmm. applet security manager. Um, if it is loaded from the client's local disk, it's loaded by the file system loader. Uh, applets loaded locally have a lot more access, so they can read files, write files, and load libraries to, on the client. Um, also, applets loaded by the file system are allowed to execute processes, and finally, um, they are not passed through the bytecode verifier. Essentially, yeah, if they're loaded from local, they have a lot more access to the user's computer than once loaded over the internet. Yeah. Do we need to provide, the user needs to provide any permission for, uh, for the applet, for them create files or delete files, or if they just per, uh, allow Java, it will work by default? I'm not sure. <laughs> I think um, it's run through the browser. So I imagine if they allow Java and the browser is trusted that they should work, but uh, that it should just work, but I'm, I'm not 100% sure on that. Yeah, it, it should. Uh, it's not like JavaScript. So in JavaScript, mm -hmm. we have the same to manipulate files, but we need to ask permission to uh, yeah. load camera, audios, write files, uh, have access to SO. Uh, yeah, JavaScript <laughs> is something like that. So um, let me move on and ask you, uh, what are the layers okay, of uh, RMI architecture? Um, RMI architecture consists of the following layers, the stub and skeleton layers. The, this, these layers lie just beneath the view of the developer. This layer is responsible for intercepting method calls made by the client to the interface and redirecting those calls mm -hmm. to a remote RMI service. Um, the remote reference layer, the second layer of the RMI architecture deals with the interpretation of references made from the client to the server's remote objects. This layer interprets and manages um, references made from the client to the remote service objects. The connection is one-to-one -one link. And the transport layer, which is responsible for connecting the two JVMs participating in the service. This layer is based on TCP IP connections between mm -hmm. machines and the network, and it provides basic connectivity as well as some firewall penetration strategies. 
<laughs> nice. You just killed my next question again. I'm glad you did because I would ask you what is the main uh, connective protocol that a transport layer uses. But you are at answer, so I'm great for that. So, <laughs> all right. So let's move on. What is DGC? Okay, DGC, and how does it work? Uh, DGC stands for Distributed yeah. Garbage Collection. Um, RMI uses DGC for automatic garbage collection. Um, since RMI involves remote object references between you know, in, uh, different machines and JVMs, um, garbage collection can be quite difficult. Uh, the DGC uses a reference counting algorithm to provide automatic memory reference management for remote mm -hmm. objects. Basically so that um, your, your remote computer doesn't deallocate some object that's being referenced by another one in yeah. you know, the interface. Uh, as you can, I'm sure you can imagine. <laughs> yeah, if, if we have a, a copy of the object or clone and that object uh, makes some reference to another one, the garbage mm -hmm. collector won't delete them, right? Well, that's normal garbage collection, yeah. But the, the DGC, the whole point is because it's two like completely separate apps running that are just talking to each other, that one mm -hmm. mustn't you know, deallocate something that might be needed by the other one. So it's a little more complex and that's the point of the DGC. Correct. Great. So, uh, and why isn't a string length function uh, accurated? I had to read this up because <laughs> I wasn't, yeah. Essentially, it isn't accurate because it'll only account for the number of characters within the string, um, which sounds like it should be accurate. But in other words, it'll fail to account for code points outside of what is called the BMP, the basic multilingual plane. That is, code points with a value above u plus 1000. Um, the reason is historical. When Java was first defined, one of its goals was to treat all text as Unicode. But at this time, Unicode did not define code points outside of the BMP. By the time Unicode defined such code points, it was too late for, the char, uh, for char to be changed. And that is a weird one. <laughs> yeah, but it makes sense. Right. <laughs> All right. So uh, thanks, James. That was my last uh, question for you. OK, normally we go to uh, code questions and I will leave these for another video. OK, I will okay. just like to call call on our developer fellow here. If you want to see how the code challenge or the code question for Java works, um, all you need to do is just uh, hit the like button, subscribe to our channel if you are not subscribed already, and comment down below. I wanna see the Java code challenge, and then we're gonna make this video for you, okay? Till then, don't forget to subscribe to Turing.com. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel, like this video, follow us on Instagram, LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, uh, Club, Clubhouse. We have a lot of social networks, so go ahead on uh, community.turing.com. We have a lot of events doing there. Uh, we talk about Java, we talk about JavaScript, Python, English. We, we help you to uh, skill up your English skills. Okay. And then, and tune then. So that was my pleasure. So, James, you were really a great developer. Okay. Uh, thanks for attending this interview today. And I hope to see you again. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, I enjoyed it a lot. It was, it was, it was a good time. <laughs> Thank you, and I hope to see you all in the next video. Bye.